Well, hello everyone, good day to you, and a very warm welcome to this Innovate Finance and Eigen Technologies webinar on how banks can use AI and data to overcome key strategic challenges. My name is Rolf Merchant, I'm part of the team at Innovate Finance, and I'll be hosting today. So today's webinar is brought to you by Eigen Technologies, and I'm delighted to say that we have the CEO and co-founder of Eigen, Lewis Liu, joining us to present. I'll give you a quick intro to Lewis. Uh, he co-founded Eigen in 2015. He was formerly a senior advisor to law firm Linklaters, where he co-founded the Tactical Opportunities Team. And Lewis previously founded the Quantitative Finance and Strategies Division of Alaron Partners, which is a boutique private equity advisory firm. I'm sure Lewis will tell you a bit more about himself and uh, his experiences uh, running Eigen over the course of this webinar, which, as I said at the top, is all about how banks can use AI and data to help overcome strategic challenges they are facing. So just to tee up this topic a little bit, which is a really timely and a really interesting one, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, will know that banks and financial services institutions have been grappling with competitive and, and regulatory pressures for many years now. And that's a situation that's obviously been compounded very much by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's led to firms really exploring how to make their business models fit for purpose. And many are now realizing that AI is no longer a nice to have, but has become an integral part of uh, running a profitable financial services businesses. Um, so key risks that and drivers that institutions are facing, and that's what Lewis is gonna cover on this webinar, will they include regulatory change, volatility, and, and a shifting competitive landscape. And as I said, Lewis is going to explore these and look at how AI and data can be used to overcome them. Very quickly before I hand over to Lewis, a quick note for the audience. Please do feel free to ask questions using the Zoom webinar platform, um, the, the little Q&A box there. I will address as, as many of these as I can to Lewis when we get onto the Q&A in about 30 minutes or so. But that's it for me. I'll hand over to you, Lewis, um, and take us through this topic. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Ralph. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I'm gonna to hope to make this um, as, as interactive uh, as possible. So uh, as Rob mentioned, if you do have questions, please do, please do ask. Um, and and um, uh, here we go. Uh, Rob, can, can you see my screen? Yeah, all perfect. Okay, great. So as Rob mentioned today, I, I'm gonna to talk about uh, what, what I sort of consider to be the three biggest strategic challenges um, if you are a incumbent uh, financial institution, as well as also if you're a sort of FinTech uh, you know, what, what are sort of some of the things to, to consider? So just really quickly, I'm gonna give a one minute introduction about what we do. I'll, I'll talk through these challenges, how AI specifically in finance uh, can address them. I'll do a really quick present, uh, sort of what does AI look like in practice, um, as well as maybe looking at a really sort of pertinent case study uh, from this year, um, and, then, and then talk about, you know, what AI can actually do today and not just in the future. So really quickly about ourselves, we are a document AI platform that transforms uh, documents, natural languages, uh, and uh, sort of tables into structured usable data. And we're also able to extract data and answer key questions from these documents to help you make better investment decisions, scale up operations, um, manage regulatory risk, um, et cetera. Uh, we work with um, uh, over one third, actually now 40% of the GSIB world's largest banks, investment managers, fintechs, law firms, and other businesses. Uh, you'll notice also here, um, Goldman Sachs and ING um, are, are actually our strategic investors uh, who, who are also some of our largest customers um, as well. So that's a, just a really quick rundown um, about Eigen. So the three big challenges that uh, we think businesses of, of sort of finance faces today is competition, Regulatory and ESG, I'm putting them into one bucket and growing uncertainty. Let's sort of deep dive into them. <clears throat> so just taking, looking at uh, competition and why digital transformation is so important. This is the UK government survey of retail banking satisfaction um, in 2020. Uh, the next one I think is coming out in August. Of the three of the top four uh, most best rated of overall service quality are fintech startups and scale ups, um, and and actually that that's sort of pretty incredible that you know that that three the only four that is rated above eighty percent and they're mostly fintech startups or scale ups. In fact, the only one that is not is actually First Direct, which you may or may not know is actually just a sub brand of HSBC, 
but has actually has undergone a really sort of completely, uh, you know, a sort of complete reset in terms of brand and operations. I mean, it's sort of incredible that, a, you know, a single bank like HSBC has such varying differing experiences, even though it's the same balance sheet uh, and same bank. I think that actually shows a really nice example of the threat that these fintech and scale-ups pose, as well as what you can actually achieve if you actually have gone through, you know, the digital transformation journey, as we see with the bifurcation here of First Direct and HSBC, which is, I think is absolutely fascinating. So let's sort of zoom out a little bit um, and not uh, away from not just UK retail banking, but the overall sort of environment. Um, Jimmy Diamond um, famously said, I think even a month ago, banks have enormous competitive threats from virtually every angle. FinTech and Big Tech are here big time. And what's really interesting is if we look at stuff as of end of April, if you look at the valuation of top American and Chinese banks through FinTech, we see that actually the, at the time, the most valuable financial company is actually a technology company, Visa, um, slightly ahead of JP Morgan. Um, in fact, we can see, of course, PayPal and financial are really coming into the mix. You saw that effectively Coinbase um, uh, actually came ahead when the IPO came ahead of CME Group. Uh, I mean, that's, that's sort of incredible if you actually sort of think about this. And, and of course, you can argue that a lot of these valuations are overblown or high, but the reality of the fact that a lot of these fintechs have access to capital via the very high valuations. A lot of the fintech companies um, have you know, some regulatory arbitrage, I have the quote unquote sidestep regulatory hurdles, um, are digitally native, are customer native, um, and are much super fast moving and super dynamic. But of course, as, in, as incumbent financial institutions and asset managers, do, they, um, do you actually have some competitive edge and there are some weaknesses to this newer fintechs. Um, they, they lack historic uh, and or deeper market data. Um, they don't have as deep of a manufacturing capability of products as incumbent players. Uh, there is regular uncertainty. We, we just saw recently, um, you know, the situation with China and crypto and the uncertainty that that's caused um, and, and certainly from my personal perspective, you know, there's no way that, um, uh, you know, large powers or superpowers like America and China will allow um, its sort of monopoly on fiat money to go unchecked via, uh, you know, and, and how that plays into with crypto. So therefore, there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty around that, um, as well as, um, um, I, 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 again, the high valuation of all the fintechs is actually based on perceived issues of incumbents. But the incumbents can actually deal and properly digitize, actually a lot of the perceived issues might go away and actually might even out the valuation playing field. And now that we're sort of, you know, I'm, I'm talking mostly to a European uh, audience, I want to also, you know, talk about something quite stark here, which I think most people in European finance will be uh, will understand, which is that European banks are not only squeezed by fintech, you're also squeezed by American banks. Um, the left-hand chart uh, from Bloomberg is really stark of just seeing, you know, up, uh, and, and, and sort of on the market side of fixed income and equity, just how much more the American banks have pulled away uh, in, in 2018 versus 2020 in both fixed income um, and, and equities. And the right-hand chart, um, this is not a pretty picture, right? Um, we, we see here that American banks not only have significantly um, um, uh, have, have you know really really high uh, you know significantly higher price to book ratio as well as generally higher return on equity. Actually, what's super interesting here uh, is that even as a European bank that you may have very high ROE, you're still being punished by being in Europe. So so I think there is you know I think there is a bit of a wake up call on on European finance in terms of your you know being squeezed both from the, the fintechs that are coming as well as the American banks. And how, how do we sort of think through this? So that's, that's on the regular, that's on the, um, um, uh, th th that's on the competition side, which I think poses a pretty stark picture, paints a pretty stark picture. Um, the next I wanna talk about is regulation and ESG. Everyone knows regulation compliance ESG. It's a really, really big, big topic. Um, what, what, what's sort of really, uh, you know, what's really interesting is, um, I love this, uh, this is a bit old, but this economist report 
uh, that shows that the number of times compliance is, man, uh, is mentioned in annual reports of 2006 versus 2018 uh, is quite interesting. And the right hand chart just shows the net flow of quote unquote sustainable funds. And we'll talk about what that quote unquote means uh, in a bit. It's just really skyrocketing in 2020. We saw Q1 2021 being sort of phenomenal. So growth from that as well. But all this is basically saying, and the central theme around what is finance's responsibility to society, right? Both through regulation like Dodd Frank uh, to prevent another um, uh, sort of Lehman Brothers situation and, you know, we didn't quite prevent the tables, but could have, um, as well as, you know, that, that's sort of the, how to prevent the downside risk of a lot of the new regulations coming on board, but as well as how do you sort of prop up the upside uh, through, through ESG and how does that serve society as a whole, I think is actually being questioned and being evaluated by, by, by the public sector. LIBOR is the latest, greatest example of this. Massive pain, $400 trillion of exposure. Uh, fantastic sort of reporting here done by Bloomberg. You know, LIBOR exit to cost global banks each, uh, you know, $100 million. That is just unaccounted cost. Uh, as in, you know, that was not that sort of, you know, it just costs you half to pay. $400 trillion, by the way, is 20 times US GDP. The scale for something like this is enormous. And LIBOR is not the only new regulatory thing that's coming our way, um, right? The complexity of such that actually resulted in USD LIBOR being sent into 2023, as everyone here knows. Um, and one bank we know was supposed to, supposed to spend hundreds of million dollars on just reviewing this manual contract to understand this exposure. And just to give you a flavor for this and where those numbers come from, a typical bank has somewhere between 10,000 to 100,000 deals and a law firm without using AI uh, would typically charge 1,000 to $5,000 per contract with paper. That is, this type of scale is, is unprecedented in terms of uh, what a repapering exercise is. And I think it's just a harbinger for things to come with respect to regulation. As well, you know, for things to come, if you, I ask many, many sort of professionals in the consulting and professional service sphere, I ask them, you know, what is the next LIBOR? Many people talk about ESG, but ESG has a similar problem to LIBOR in so far, in so far as the data quality and understanding what underpins ESG metrics. And I, I, I love this sort of this, this piece of analysis done, um, which actually shows, uh, there's a link below, uh, which actually shows just the divergence of different ESG rating agencies and actually just how big of a gap that is depending on how you look at it. And as a result, there is no common standard of thinking about ESG and therefore investors and banks need to make their own decisions and be able to justify them and stand by them. Uh, as a BI, for example, is a new regulation that requires you to do that, which is another uplifted data collection and, and again, you have to go back to the source data, which again is in sort of unstructured human language and charts and graphs and pieces of paper. And, and how do we actually get, get to that? I, I just love how, I mean, I don't love, but it's, it's stark just how divergent all these points of data are and are on these rates. And the next sort of point is, is we talked about competition, we talked about regulation or sort of what is, what is finance going to do publicly or on, on, on a social service to his society. The next is about growing uncertainty. Uh, I think that I'm not, you know, there's just a little, if you read the press today, there's just so much uncertainty and market volatility. And we can sort of quantify this. We can look at some, some data that's, I think, really interesting. It's not just uncertainty, it's also liquidity. I think it's a combination of unprecedented liquidity combined with volatility that's actually a really dangerous cocktail in the world of finance, of FOMO, as in I'm searching for a yield, I have to get into the super risky deal or else, and the risk that's, that's driven by the uncertainty of, of unemployment, inflation, um, and, and, and sort of just, you know, and then actually if you look at this, on the left-hand chart, you can see the change in the money supply uh, by the Fed. Uh, I, I mean, we've, we've added, you know, $3 trillion during the pandemic um, to the money supply, um, as well as coinciding with this massive shift of, of you know, unprecedented volatility. Uh, if you actually look at the VIX index, you know, it peaked higher than any time in history uh, during the pandemic. And, and I think our takeaways 
the Archego story is a story of our times. I think it is a perfect example of the victim of this Kafka cocktail, right? Um, the, the banks hunting for yield are you know, trying to do more leverage and form what was supposedly a low risk business uh, and prime brokerage. And the combination of extreme liquidity in the market combined with high tech valuations, high volatility effectively led to the margin call collapse here. Um, and it unraveled faster than anyone thought. And interestingly, part of this is also, I think there's a fantastic FT article about this that talks about how the, you know, this was partially due to the, the delaying of the Dodd-Frank implementation. So all this is true, but we still need to make money, right? And we still need to take risks in this crazy market because you know, we are finances in the business of taking measured risk and generating returns. But how do we do this in a world where we're being in a world where we're being outstripped by Silicon Valley or the Chinese uh, in terms of new technology nimbleness faster? I, I love this sort of you know picture of a car and you know, the horse drawn carriage here, as well as sort of being piled under by paperwork uh, through, um, and and sort of data discovery from regulation ESG as well as an extremely uncertain world of high liquidity mixed with high volatility. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really sort of quite you know, challenging macro picture of, of, of what's going to happen. Now, of course, I'm, I am a CEO of an AI company. Um, the solution, of course, is uh, AI plus digitization. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not, there, there's actually a lot more complexity here Right, I'm, I'm being you know slightly uh, uh, tongue in cheek here. Of course, there's operating uh, uh, sort of operating model changes and all these things. But when we also when we think about AI digitization, it's not uh, you know the picture on the left. I'm a big Star Trek geek, guys. So this Lieutenant Commander Data. You know, he's an android. He can talk. He can walk. He can do all the calculations and basically run a bank in his head um, if, if if someone had access to him. Uh, but more on the right hand side, which are really specific applications designed to do certain things. Uh, customer segmentation, macro language processing, which is what we do, um, image recognition through neural nets, and, and being able to apply these really specific applications in AI in really thinking through your operating model, are you actually able to deal, I think, with the three big challenges. And I think the scale and the need for AI is really big, as well as the need for AI for AI, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, and, and in order to use AI properly to do the data analytics, make the data useful, we need to take back, we need to step back. 98% of the world's data have never been analyzed, according to McKinsey. 90% of the world's data is unstructured, e.g., more or less unusable. Um, and, and by the way, if you're an incumbent player, um, that number is probably higher. And also, um, because you may have not started your business uh, digitally native from the ground up, and unlike the fintechs, you're going to need access to that data, right? Um, and of course, the unstructured data is growing at an annual rate of basically more than doubling uh, every two years. And, and so what effectively you need to do before you can even crunch the numbers, run the data analytics, and run the sort of the, the, the AI-based or, or RPA-based operating model to digitize and automate, you actually need to get your unstructured data to a place where you can do that, which is why you need AI again to do that, which is what we call AI for AI. And just to give you sort of a bit of context here, uh, in 2020 alone, I can process about $80 trillion worth of contracts. That's about four times US GDP. Sort of crazy when we when we start thinking about there in terms of multiples of US GDP and answer about 200 million different queries. Um, each query, by the way, would have been answered traditionally by a analyst, a trader, a lawyer, et cetera. So so really seeing that that sort of scale uh, happen in, in 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 the world. And and I think the point here is is also that AI and finance is no longer a nice to have. It is a must have. So in terms of competition, you need, you need to start using AI to accelerate your digital transformation because again, not everything's gonna be super straightforward like a logic tree or decision tree. 
you know, there are going to be nuances where you need some kind of AI to process, like documents, like chatbots, like image recognition. Um, for example, um, you know, insurers taking using image recognition to look at, you know, uh, sites, et cetera. You need to be able to leverage both your qualitative, um, quantitative data and your qualitative data like documents. Um, and especially a lot of those data that your companies don't have. So you can access that, you, you know, you, you have an edge, but again, that is forming an AI arms race. Uh, to, in order to compete against the fintechs who are super fast moving and digitally native, you need to start to speed up and improve your customer operations. Uh, you know, one customer I've seen, um, you know, reduce the customer onboarding time by 5x using AI. Then uh, to deal with the regulation ESG is just the sheer scale I mentioned, for example, on LIBOR. Um, again, if, if you don't use AI, you're liable to spend literally hundreds of million dollars of human manual labor. And by the way, it's going to be less accurate than the AI. Um, but at the same time, you can actually make this into a competitive advantage. Uh, one bank we've seen were able to reduce risk-weighted assets uh, by 20% by collecting really detailed data from their collateral documentation and then therefore building out much more detailed LGD models to be able to switch from standard RWA calculations to IRB RWA calculations. Um, again, and I, I talked about actually understanding the underlying ESG metrics and versus just greenwashing. And this is not important just to comply with things like SFDR that's coming online and some of the regulation that uh, Biden administration is thinking through, but also just frankly to actually make the world a better place by actually better place in the ESG bets. And the growing uncertainty, you need to react much faster. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk through a really specific case study uh, later today, but the situations like Greenso or Archegos really do require less than 24 hour turnaround time. Uh, you, you, there's, a, there's a growing geopolitical tension that's growing. Um, and, and really, you know, at some point we think there might be a, will be a correction. And we like to say here at Eigen, when the music stops, you got to look at your dots and you can do that faster with AI. So, so I'm, I'm going to do a, a really quick, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, a sort, of a, a sort of demonstration of just how this might work in real practice. Um, so imagine you are a wholesale bank. Uh, you are an agent bank uh, to, to lots of different syndicated loans. Um, and you find out through a rumor that you might get downgraded by Moody's um, uh, in, in the next week because of whatever thing that you, you've been hit. Um, that's, that's a really big sort of impact on your ability to actually do business. That's sort of just imagine that, right? Uh, and regulators are breathing down your throat. Um, you need to let your counterparties know. And you need to move quickly to deal with this uncertainty and this extreme volatility of what's happening. So what we effectively have is we have a, you know, we have these loan documents that you need to understand what's going to happen to you, basically stipulate what's going to happen to you if you as an agent bank gets downgraded. So let's, let's, let's actually do that analysis from scratch. Imagine we have never done this before. I was just going to call this webinar demo. Create a new project, um, actually, uh, I need to sign in. Great. And then I'm going to say, look, I need to under, I'm going to, I'm going to start teaching machine. What are the things I need to understand in case I get downgraded? And what are the conditions for downgrade? For the sake of time uh, for this webinar, I'm just going to look at the conditions for downgrade. Um, so, but what I'm going to teach the machine is effectively, what is the acceptable bank? And I can sort of ask the machine, you know, uh, what is acceptable bank clause? So what happens when the bank gets downgraded uh, for an uh, agent bank in this situation? And I can also ask the machine, what is the booty specific um, What is the Moody specific downgrade, which I can actually point out as a point of traction. So I can actually ask that really specific question, um, in which case it's A3. And let's do one more question, which is in case things go bad and goes into lit litigation, I want to know what the governing law is. So I'm gonna ask the question, 
Dog Law. And I'm going to teach. So what I'm doing now is teaching machine. I'm literally highlight. I'm literally highlighting. Um, I'm sort of just literally highlighting, clicking and dragging and teaching machine. This is English government law. So I taught the machine on this one document. I'm now going to do it for the next one. So I'm going to teach the. Um, I'm going to teach this platform here. What is acceptable bank on this document? What is the Moody's specific downgrade? So what I'm basically doing now is, uh, hey, Ralph, can you hear me? The, the line, yeah, it's just, the line just cut out for a sec, but, but we're okay. You might want to just backtrack for the last 30 seconds of what you were saying. Okay, so what effectively I've been doing is teaching machine each of these three questions. What is the acceptable bank clause? Uh, what is the Moody specific downgrade? And what is the governing law? And I'm actually just highlighting the answer and telling, showing the machine where it is as a human being. So what effectively done now is I've taught the machine on two examples, these two loan documents, and actually taught the machine three questions. So what I can do now is create a model so effectively, imagine a human being and you're asking an analyst to do this. Um, and effectively what you've done is you've highlighted a bunch of um, right answers, you've labeled them. And now you're gonna tell the analyst, learn up how to do it. Tomorrow I'm gonna to come and I'm gonna give you a gazillion documents to do the same thing. That's exactly what we taught the AI. Actually today, we're actually building an AI machine learning model from scratch in real life. And actually that's actually one of the more interesting things about our platform is actually the fact that instead of needing, you know, you may think of AI as big data where you might need a thousand or 10,000 examples. I can use only two to 50 examples to teach a machine on something. So when we talk about the risk uh, in terms of being agile versus competition, or when we talk about the situation when a new regulation comes on board, we're talking talk about situation here, which we're pretending that it might be downgraded next week. You need to understand this now, this kind of flexibility in production is sort of, uh, I think, a really sort of interesting uh, ability uh, by, by the platform. So the machine is now specifically, you know, learning how to answer the question, you know, what is acceptable bank clause? It's learning how to find the Moody specific downgrade and learning where, uh, how to answer the question uh, governing law. So, one other really sort of important thing here um, is, is uh, I want to mention is that a lot of financial institutes also really want or sort of like to DIY or build things themselves. Um, and what, what, what that we discovered uh, is that um, uh, we, you, know, you can actually have uh, best of all worlds uh, where effectively um, we also offer a full uh, developer kit of APIs um, that allow users uh, to um, actually develop on top of the platform. Um, so, everything's now built. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to upload six documents that the machine has never seen before. Uh, so, these are so imagine I've just taught the analyst on how to answer these questions. Now I'm actually going to give it six documents that the machine um, has never seen before, that the analyst hasn't seen before, and now we're seeing if we can rep replicate that. Um, so effectively, that's what I'm doing. So I'm going to select the two documents I've, I've taught it, as well as the six new documents. I'm going to create a new analysis. I'm called A1. I'm going to run it. So here, um, it's a sort of similar data table where the roles represent each of the new documents I'm looking to analyze for the AI and the columns represent the new the questions. I actually taught the machine uh, from scratch. Um, I, we can do a lot more with this, but start asking like more qualitative questions um, using you, you sort of business logic rules and things like that. But for the purpose of time, just show you the basics of, the, um, of, of, of sort of how, the, how a, 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 you know, an AI technology uh, might, might look like. But we can actually start seeing that actually the machine is starting to populate uh, uh, the results. Um, 
And what's interesting, for example, is you can actually click in and actually it will take you exactly uh, to the right answer. Uh, here, in this case, it's A1. And what's also interesting uh, is that if you notice, I taught the machine only on English governing law, but it's also able to pick up French governing law as well, even though I never taught it that. Uh, so it's actually able to understand the context and the content of the answer and the question. Um, so, so anyway, um, I've only taught the machine on two examples. So actually, um, this is done a pretty good job. Typically, I need a bit more. But I can see how I can iteratively teach machine uh, more and more examples um, of this. Anyway, that's that's just a really quick quick um, uh, quick quick demonstration or of, of of how these type of technologies might work uh, in real life in a critical uh, situation. Um, I'm now going back to um, just going back to the presentation. The other challenge with AI. Is, is, is also not just sort of getting things into production, it's also how do you maintain it from a model governance um, and accuracy rate uh, perspective, a model risk management perspective, which a lot of mature banks uh, have. Um, so, so the first thing we, we, what we do is we call something called model evaluation or model risk management. Now, inside the platform, you could actually teach the machine, uh, I'm sorry, you could actually, the machine can actually estimate what the accuracy uh, rate of, uh, of, of models will be in production is confidence wise. So just as in, in finance, we have four eyes check. The machine does the same thing. We actually run it through multiple models. If they agree, it's a high confidence answer. If this, they disagree, it's a low confidence answer. Plug-in verification, we're not all just AI. It's actually a combination of AI and some rules, some heuristics to make sure if I extract the date, it's the date. If it's an entity, it's an entity, et cetera. And finally, everything gets sent for manual review in case things don't work. So, um, and typically what we see is around 90% actually gets straight through processing without any humans review, while 10% requires some kind of human review. But that is still, you know, 90% savings in terms of time and cost when you're thinking about all of these sort of pressure points that you have when you're trying to, you know, get documents out for KYC, uh, for better customer onboarding, or when you're trying to, you know, report on ESG, or when, you know, when there's a sort of market moving situation. And actually I want to give an example of a market moving uh, situation. Um, this is actually really interesting. It was a, it's a bankruptcy that happened this year. Um, I can't mention who, uh, but effectively, and, and the, the timelines here are, are real, but the, some of the days are changed. Uh, but imagine on Monday, and by the way, this is a real case study, uh, there's a major bankruptcy that's now all over the front page news. The law firm representing the creditors reaches out to Eigen. This is what happened. Uh, the next day, we ran a proof of concept. Uh, the next day, we, we, we signed the MSA. On Friday, the clients uploaded all the documents. And by Saturday, they were able to answer all of the questions um, in such a way that all the, and all, the, all the data points got sent back to the creditors to make the decision. Um, the final accuracy rate was 99% accurate, such that the lawyers didn't even need further human review. And by the way, these documents were not seen before by anyone else. Um, and, and just going through the process I just shown you, that's how, you know, I think a real life example of how AI can actually interact in the real world. So just taking a step back, um, just to wrap this up. I started my career at in the, at the height of the financial crisis in 2008. Um, saw a lot of, you know, bad data in banks, uh, and 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 you know, I think uh, at hindsight 2020. But um, if you've ever seen the big short, the movie, there's a great scene of uh, Michael Byrne played by Christian Bale uh, here, laying sprawled on the floor, reading these massive CLO CDO documents, which, by the way, is actually one of my big use cases. And he was able to make the determination to short the market by going through all of this data painstakingly manually. But imagine if you can do that, well, not just imagine, that does happen today with platforms like Eigen, do that automatically, upload all that data into the cloud, um, being able to uh, collect all the quality of the data via AI, and then actually start actually interacting uh, with the data, making decisions, automating processes. And I think really the, that that is able to happen today. So I, I really want to stress that yes, we have competition and 
POWs and regulation and really deep uncertainty. But this is not 2008. There's technology here today that allows you to work with your customers faster, to become digitally native like, like your FinTech competitors, uh, to become, to react and make regulation a, a strategic asset, a strategic advantage, and as well as fundamentally react faster and better to the market. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for, uh, for listening. And I'm very happy to take questions at this point. Lewis, thank you ever so much. That was uh, that was an excellent presentation, and it's uh, it's amazing how much of fintech you know all comes back to two thousand and eight and and everything that that, that happened there. Um, great sort of coverage of, of some of the issues as well, and 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 lovely to see your 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 model demoed as well. That was great. Um, yeah, audience, uh, if you do have questions, do do please um, fire them along. Um, I can I can put them to Lewis in the next um, ten minutes or so before we wrap up. And actually, Lewis, I've got, I've actually got a couple of questions of my own if if, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, and, and sort of, I think, kind of reflecting on a, on a couple of things. One is, um, in a sense, what we tend to hear, I mean, having kind of sat, th sat through many sessions about sort of, you know, B B2B fintech and fintechs wanting to partner up with, with banks and institutions, I guess some of the, you know, the common questions that, that get asked. Um, just a couple of sort of around, you know, I guess, data and, and how, how, you know, your, your, your model, your technology can be implemented. There's, there's quite a common question, which is sort of how, yeah, how much data do you actually need in the first place? I mean, at what point does this become, um, if you like, useful to 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 um, to implement a model like yours? How, how would you answer? That? How much how much yeah. data do you need to use an AI platform like this? Yeah. Actually, I would I would sort of flip that around and actually say, what is the minimal amount of data you need to make this useful? Because one of the biggest bottlenecks of getting AI into production is that you need a lot of time, a lot of data, a lot of time to annotate data to make it useful. Um, and I, our R&D team have done a lot of that hard, heavy lifting. So actually when we deploy our platform, you literally can do what you saw there. I mean, imagine like we can basically got, get to the answer across all the documents about that downgrade trigger event in about less than an hour. Yeah. So, so, so actually, where, I think this is where I think is really unique is again, instead of needing a thousand or 10,000 examples to teach the machine on a new document or a new question, we need only two to 50 examples. Meaning that even if you have 50 or 100 documents that you want to do a quick and dirty review, we can do it. And the platform can easily handle it in a matter of minutes. Or if you do have millions of documents or tables or whatnot that you want to extract and analyze, I can, can do that too. And I think so we're able to actually wear sort of what we call sort of scale invariant uh, from that perspective. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Okay. Um, and, and another question I had was just going back to, I mean, you, you mentioned it in brief in your slides there, just about sort of, um, I guess, safeguards. Um, what, what, what can be put in place to make sure that, you know, models perform as expected or that, you know, the, the data is correct? How does that work? What, what assurances can you give people? Of course. So, so I think the first is um, making sure that you have a training set and a test set making sure that your test set is separate. Um, and there are all various techniques in machine learning to, to be able to, uh, as I mentioned, mentioned, predict what the accuracy rate might look like in production. Um, and, and for us, we actually make it super easy. We just have a client, we have our customers click a button and it will be able to predict what the accuracy rate looks like. I think that's a really important safeguard. And we also, by the way, also generate a report for your model risk management team. Um, so, so I think that, I think being able to interact extremely transparently with, your, with the model risk management team, if, as a bank, you have one. I think mm -hmm. that's really important. And then the other safeguards I mentioned about making sure running multiple models, not just one model, right? It's just like the four eyes check, making sure it's two humans that review something, not one human. So I think what's interesting is I think a lot of the governance procedures that, that have been useful with the purely human manual process, mm -hmm. we can actually sort of adapt that as, as sort of AI as, as a, a process as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I see that. That, that that's um, that's a good answer. Um, and just thinking about you know partnerships with you know with banks a little bit more. I guess on the uh, kind of on the human level, if you like. And technology is great, and 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 obviously that's called cool to what you do. But in terms of sort of interacting with um, say um, you know, data science teams or innovation teams in in banks and institutions, how do you how, how does that work? And yeah. how you know is there do you see there being a particular model for success there, or um, to yeah. talk us through that? Uh, yeah, of course. So I think we, uh, when we sell IGEM, we actually have two different ways of selling it. One is the desktop app, which is exactly what we just saw here, but drag some buttons, you know, 
highlight a couple of things and off we go. But the predominant way we serve large institutions uh, or actually fintechs who actually uh, have built an entire product around uh, us uh, is actually what we call Eigen for developers or Eigen data scientists. So here, uh, what we realize is that banks do like building things themselves, right? And I think partially is because they, 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 it's important that they have bespoke systems that they connect with. And so therefore, and actually we enable that. Um, so we actually have a full software development kit, a full sort of data science kit as well, um, where you can actually interact and connect with everything yourself. So when we actually interact with the data scientists, we actually say, hey, I know you built all this stuff already. Here is a best of breed toolkit to, to, put, to, to inject into your existing solution. So, so what I think we try to offer best of both worlds. If you want to build it yourself, Eigen is a tool. If you can't be bothered, we have the full platform available for the front end users. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Good. Um, maybe just to pick up on your, your, your last point in, in, uh, in your presentation, you know, you were sort of giving a bit of a sort of, you know, um, look ahead to, you know, what digital transformation can mean and, and how, how we're equipped to sort of, you know, face up challenges much more today than we were in 2008. Um, you know, in, in rough terms, and may, maybe from your kind of own personal perspective, as much as from an Eigen one, you know, where do you see the kind of big developments, you know, kind of technology wise within, um, within the financial services world over the next, say, five years? What, what do you see that sort of landscape looking like? Yeah. I think um, I, I can speak mostly to, to more wholesale banking and asset management. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think what fundamentally, we are in a risk management and capital allocation business, right? At the end of the day, this is anything that makes us better aware of our risks in order to make those risk-based decisions and, and, and then allocating capital against that and being able to make it easy to transact is, is going to be the winning sort of solution. If you, if you think about a banking asset management, it's very simple, yeah. I mean, quote, unquote, simple for both terms. Mm. So I think there is, Lots of low-hanging fruit uh, technologies um, that are, are 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 really sort of accelerating uh, in this. So a lot of sort of various sort of transaction um, and payments technology just makes it easier to transfer money, easier to transact. Um, a lot of uh, you know a lot of new uh, sort of alternative data providers coming in to make it easier, or faster uh, to to collect data and to make decisions. Of course, all all the way in the downstream, you have vendors like. Um, uh, data robot, MATLAB, um, and Tableau that make it easier to ingest and analyze this data and come out with decisions. Um, and of course, you have vendors like ours and other people like us to, to actually take all this nebulous sort of document NLP data and actually make it to be useful data from an operating perspective, decision making perspective. So I think the, the transformation that's going to happen in wholesale banking and asset management really is around how do I collect data better? Mm -hmm. How do I use data better? And then how do I use that data faster? Yeah. And I think that like, I think all this technology is actually pretty mature, yeah. right? Like, and I think it's, it's all about just putting it together in the right way, so. Yeah, that's a good answer. That's uh, that's very clear. Um, I, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll make this the last question. Um, you, you gave us some, some nice use cases of, 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 your, of your product in action. Is there anything you can tell us about Kind of product roadmap or, or any kind of new directions you might be going in over the foreseeable future? Um, sure. I think one of them, there are two really exciting things that 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 uh, that we have. I think one is uh, we just launched it, which is a uh, tables extraction API capability. Um, so so uh, you know for all your financial statements, um, all of the brokerage statements that that you want to transform into either a database or into Excel. Um, uh, we now actually have, you know, literally you upload whatever document you want um, and out comes a structured table that's usable immediately, even if it's scanned or, or whatever. Because how many times have you tried to copy and paste a table from a PDF into Excel and it ended up being completely terrible? And that's actually, so, so we've been able to solve that on top of our natural language processing capability. So that's really exciting and people are able to actually build applications on top of that. Um, so one bank, for example, has built a automatic covenant checker. Um, so they've actually extracted all the information from, from the loan documents um, and married that with uh, taking um, uh, quarterly filings um, 
Um, and then on the financial documents, which is actually, and actually being able to marry them to come mm. that company. Mm. That's pretty cool. Second thing that I think is really exciting um, is, uh, you know, that labeling process I told you about yeah. teaching yeah. machine. Um, uh, we're actually coming out with something on which you don't even need to teach the machine. Uh, mm. Where you can literally ask the question, what is the transfer fee? And the machine will answer 5,000 pounds. Or it can ask the question, um, you know, what is the Moody's downgrade trigger? It would have answered A2 without training. And, and again, um, this is made possible by a lot of recent advances in AI, but as well as sort of Eigen's really domain specific financial training data. So that's gone into it as well. That yeah. I think is super cool. That's transformative. Yeah, that, that, that is very impressive, Johnny. I will look forward to, to seeing that released and hearing more about it, Lewis. Um, but I'm afraid we are now out of time, um, but thank you so much for a really fascinating yeah. presentation and, and for discussing this topic in so much detail. Um, and audience at home, thank you for joining and for your participation. Just to say, if you do want to re-watch this webinar, um, or if you join us a little bit late, you will be able to view it all on our website, um, sort of via catch up, and there'll be an email going out about that soon. Um, but otherwise, just say, you know, please do follow us and Eigen uh, via social media, sign up to newsletters and so on. Um, obviously, us in Innovate Finance will be having many more events like this, looking at technology trends and, and um, hearing from our members in, in some detail about what they're doing. Um, but I think that's it. That just leaves me to thank Lewis Liu from Eigen for his time today. Um, and thank you very much for tuning in and uh, goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you.